All right, welcome to one of the most important topics that there are, and that's the biological basis of, of power. As we know, power underlies so much of sport. <clears throat> so what is power? You know, you say, oh, that guy's powerful, right? What does that mean? Well, definition of power is force times velocity. And some people say uh, uh, work over time. Both of those are um, legitimate physics definitions. Talk about force times velocity, it's very important because um, it talks about the relationship between those two and power. For example, right here, we see the classic force velocity curve. You see force on the horizontal axis and velocity on the vertical. You see as force increases, velocity decreases. And one of the reasons for that is that it takes a fixed amount of time for cross bridges to attach and detach. The total number of cross bridges attached decreases with increasing velocity of muscle shortening. So we can increase power by increasing velocity max, uh, force max, or decreasing the curvature of the force velocity relationship. Now one thing I want to point out is that uh, research demonstrates that resting muscle lengths are generally slightly shorter than the optimal length. And therefore, her muscular force may be increased with a slight stretch prior to activation. <clears throat> Your classic example comes from the starting block. We know that if you have a starting block, um, you actually have that pre-stretch, which contributes to greater horizontal velocity. And here, we're comparing the squat jump, which is jumping, or SJ, which is jumping from a squat, compared to counter movement jump, you can see the counter movement jump results in greater uh, jump height. That's when you do, uh, you know, you do a counter or a wind up and then jump before. And one of the reasons why is because you have more time to build up force. Lastly, I want to point out that when you do a counter movement jump, which is the CM, <coughs> if you think of your tendons as a spring, when you land, that spring is stretched. During the contraction phases, the tendons will rapidly shorten, but the tissue is able to contract in sort of a quasi-isometric state, while in a more optimal position to produce contractile force because it was stretched. Remember, according to the force velocity curve, force can be maximal when, when you are contracting isometrically. In a sense, because you're at zero velocity. Now when you have no counter movement jump, basically you have shortening primarily occurring via the muscle fibers itself, which means you don't have optimal filament overlap. <coughs> Real good uh, um, theory by Herzog, actually based on um, A.V. Hill's model of contraction where he talked about we have a parallel elastic component which is the connective tissue series elastic component which is the muscle itself um, or excuse me which is the tendon itself okay and then we have the contractile element well one thing that we can find is that the cross bridges if you look at the, the picture to the right when a cross bridge forms you could get stretching at the same time so you're actually building up elastic energy or potential energy in that cross bridge. And of course we're all familiar with this knee jerk reflex here, or the stretch reflex. When you do rapid movements, particularly such as sprinting, you're going to activate that stretch reflex, which is going to contribute to force output and power. Let's talk about morphological factors. Uh, we talk about muscle fiber makeup, architectural features, and tendon properties. So, <clears throat> if you look at fiber type, type 2 fibers have a type 2 fibers have a 3 to 4 fold greater velocity max and power max values. And also, the type 2 myosin isoforms split ATPase 600 times per second versus approximately 300 times per second for type 1 isoforms. So this allows for a short cross bridge cycling time and therefore a greater ability to develop force. Also the greater cross-sectional area allows for more force. And one thing I do want to point out is that 
it's not that fast switch fibers necessarily can produce more force per unit area because if you normalize the force between fast and slow you see that the greater force is eliminated so again in large part you're increasing cross-sectional area and force we see that here that as force goes up uh, power goes up now one thing that you know I talk a lot about when we get into the hypertrophy lectures is if you look at your muscle fibers they're a chain of essentially sarcomeres okay we understand how, how muscle fibers are sort of bound up in uh, fascicles so based on sort of the amount of those sarcomeres and the, and the actual length of the fascicle um, the longer the fascicle is the greater the velocity will actually be and it may be because you have more time to accelerate or a longer range to accelerate um, because of that fascicle length. So this could be altered by sarcomerogenesis, which typically occurs during things like eccentric training or using full range of motion. Pination angle, basically if you look at the fascicles, that they will actually have an angle relative to that connective tissue border or the deep aponeurosis. And um, the greater that angle is, basically um, the more sarcomeres can be arranged in parallel. The more sarcomeres that can be arranged in parallel, the greater the force output. So if you look at this next slide, pre-training to post-training, muscle fiber pination angle increases. So that increases power by primarily Fmax, but doesn't really either, it either doesn't change or slightly lowers Vmax. But in general, power will go up. So in summary, Power is force times velocity. The inverse relationship between force and velocity dictates that power is generally maximized at moderate weights. But as you'll see in the next lecture, that changes. Power is affected by pre-stretch, thus so preload, and power is greater in fast switch fibers. Also, force max can increase with resistance training by adding sarcomeres and increasing pin angle. Thank you, and I'll see you in the next lecture.